Lou Kessler and Pyrex Scholars presents Post Irony and Ambiguity in Transgressive Art and Music. The 90s postmodernism was all about mocking the capitalist machine to undermine it and, in a sense, disturb it, escape from it. Art under the system of capitalistic realism has assimilated the anti-authoritative nature of art back into the grasp of the spectacle. The anti-bourgeoisie practices of anti-art movements such as Dadaism and postmodern pop art are being fed to the ivory tower silk-stocking aristocrats who then regurgitate it back down to us to consume as a form of subversion. When Warhol would burn original pieces of art and only show the copies at galleries, it was an incredibly boisterous taunt to the high art world. When Damien Hirst opens up a new art collection, it's quite literally him abusing the knowledge that art has become so far removed from being a tool of critique and has morphed into this game of chicken where neither party wants to speak up against how hilariously pedestrian and meaningless the concept of political art has become for fear of looking stupid. Part of Kurt Cobain's artistic struggle was his looming fear that he was becoming everything he claimed to be fighting against. Behind all that ironic distance was a sad and broken idealist. He realized the same people who were making him famous were the same people who were spitting on him before, that their art was just being swallowed by the beast of capitalism and consumerist society. Kurt fashioned himself as an outsider and spokesman for the downtrodden loners and working class. As Chuck Klosterman points out, when his wife bought a new Lexus to replace their dilapidated Volvo, Kurt flipped out and made her take it back. Still holding on to his anti-success ethos of his punk days, he still felt his convictions enough, despite his often ironic and detached performances, to not want to be seen in self-indulgent luxury, however futile that may have seemed for a megastar. Every niche opened by rebellion against capital is immediately filled by entrepreneurs who figure out how to make money off those attempting to subvert the system. The creators of anti-consumerist and anti-capitalist works may have had the best intentions, but their work still became a product engineered for profit. Signifiers against consumption were consumed by capital and the spectacle. You can't rage against the machine when you are the machine. What is to be done when all that's left for the disruption of capital is rebellious consumption? Whitney Mallet writes in Deaccelerationism, quote, if we can't escape capitalism, if it's too all-encompassing, then maybe the only path of resistance is the exact opposite of resistance. Instead of trying to slow it down, maybe we need to speed capitalism up until it self-destructs. That's the thinking behind accelerationism anyways. An idea that finds its roots in the 19th century, authentically by Karl Marx, but which has had several iterations since. At the heart of accelerationism is a question of inevitability, if we feel like all of our alternatives and transgressions are subsumed into capitalism, is that the same as believing that this incorporation is inevitable?" End quote. Can the philosophical concept of accelerationism be applied to culture or music? What might an accelerated pop music look or sound like? In June 2013, A.G. Cook created his online label, PC Music, consisting of a SoundCloud page which offered free downloads of most of their songs and a series of strange web pages created for each release. Operating under various aliases, A.G. Cook and his partner, Danny L. Hall, created a roster of artists. Sophie, an artist from London, while never having a release for PC Music, was also integral in developing the PC Music sound. The music creates a world of plasticky synth noises and uncanny textures. It's a strange amalgamation of J-pop, New Jack Swing, 90s bubblegum trance, nightcore, UK grime, contemporary pop, happy hardcore, and many other seemingly disparate influences. It's big shiny pop with bubblegum hooks, taken out of the major label context and re-territorialized by underground UK artists. 
This avant-garde electronica for androids takes the cuteness and the unnatural joy of modern pop and pushes it to the extreme until it almost becomes nauseating. It looks to the dark core of a sound so perfectly pleasurable that it ultimately becomes creepy. It's capitalist consumerism taken to its logical extreme. It looks to pop not as a simplistic and rudimentary exercise in ephemera, but rather as an endlessly layered spectacle to be deconstructed and reconstructed. In order to understand PC music's context in contemporary culture, we can look to Oscar Capezio's essay, Hyperreality in the Postmodern Age, Kitsch and Porno Kitsch, in which he writes, quote, Through tracing a theoretical trajectory from the society of the commodity to the society of the spectacle, Baudrillard arrives at the trans-aesthetic society of simulacrum, a new dematerialized society of signs, images, and coats. Defined by Baudrillard as the moment when modernity exploded on us, the trans-aesthetic moment is one where everything becomes aestheticized, that is, manufactured into a sign for consumption. Illustrating the aestheticization of all objects and forms, Baudrillard writes, quote, everything aestheticizes itself. Politics aestheticizes itself into spectacle, sex into advertising, pornography, and the whole gamut of activities into what is held to be called culture. This culture is an advertising and media which invade every aspect of the society, end quote. Within the trans-aesthetic cultural space described by Baudrillard, where art is produced and received, the pop art of Andy Warhol veers along the final and necessary curve of things, between objects and images, and between reality and representation. From a reading of Warhol's Campbell's Soup Can series of 1962, we could argue that within a trans-aesthetic culture, even art itself is made over as a sign to be consumed visually, alongside a parade of other symbols and representations. As with the advent of pop art, we begin to interpret artworks in relation to the images we are familiar with from other visual sites, like cinema, pornography, fashion advertising, and the history of Western art. Therefore, in breaking down the distinctions between high art and low in mass culture, the coherent category of art dissolves into all other visual modalities of the postmodern world of hyperreality and implosion. While art was once conceived of as distinct from the practices and processes of consumption, the initial screen prints of commercial products by Andy Warhol problematizes this divide, collapsing the distinct aesthetic spheres of art and of mass media into an all-encompassing virtual culture. Echoing in both content and form the serial reproduction of the commodity, this renders art interchangeable with any other commodity sign, extinguishing the original reference and reducing art to the status of a non-signifying image. As a result of pop art colluding with reality, Baudrillard argues, quote, art loses its subversive force, end quote. It simply maintains the status quo of which it is part, upholding the idea that there is a coherent category called reality and a knowable entity called art. Therefore, rather than challenging these notions in the way that avant-garde once did, we see in art's turn towards the strategies of irony, quotation, appropriation, kitsch and simulation, operating at the limits of simulation in an exploitation of its reversibility and ambivalence." End quote. It's exactly this trans-aesthetic space in which PC music looked to explore. The line between music, images, advertisements and critique are intentionally blurred. Their music was often accompanied by strange websites with bizarre art and cryptic messages. Releases would often be assisted by actual product advertisements for clothing or perfume. PC Music were well aware of art's recent critical impotence in late capitalism, and rather than trying to resist it, they embraced it, pushing the aforementioned elements of kitsch, simulation, and ambiguity up to 11. The artists of PC Music were aware of the disintegration of pop art into just another commodity sign in mass media, Sophie even going so far as to acknowledge the pop art milieu in her song, Viz. Quote, if that's what you want to do, if you squish it in your hand, make it pop red and white, tomato soup can, end quote. We've gone all the way up the river in the heart of darkness. The only way out is to go through. In a true accelerationist manner, PC music emerges as Colonel Kurtz, having embraced the ways of the enemy. Critical theorist and author Jody Dean argues that in the absence of symbolic authority in postmodern culture, 
people absorb themselves in a search for authenticity. Their skepticism toward the falsity of mass culture's manufactured illusions manifesting as an ironic detachment that further distances them from meaningful connections with others. This fool's errand of ironic detachment results in a loss of vulnerability. However, new sincerity this is not. Films like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and music from bands like Arcade Fire look to replace the ironic detachment of the 90s with a vulnerability and earnestness, which ultimately comes off as a spineless return to the naivety of modernist ideals. PC music looked to take the vulnerability and twist it into an ambivalence. Listening to their 90s cheese trance, it's easy for listeners to think, this is clearly some art kid's joke. However, the concept as a whole can be taken very seriously. PC music represent an important turn in culture. They are post-ironic. In order to understand what we mean by this, we must examine the concepts of ambivalence and ambiguity. Dan Chamas in Ambiguity and Ambivalence in PC Music writes, quote, Ambiguity and ambivalence share the same prefix, ambi, which is Latin for two ways. Ambiguity, when deconstructed in Latin, means leading in two directions, where ambi means two ways and agere means to lead. For someone to experience ambivalence, they must have strong conflicting feelings. Ambiguity causes these conflicting feelings by leading in two or more conflicting directions." End quote. A. G. Cook comments that he is interested in how, quote, "...pop music and commercial imagery have the potential to be overwhelming, extravagant, and banal all at the same time." End quote. He then adds that, quote, "...mixing high culture with pop culture has lost its radical edge to the extent that it's more or less mainstream." This almost Lynchian coupling of the banal with the over-the-top extravagance is part of what makes PC Music's concept so compelling. They take the 21st century's obsession with cuteness and excess to their logical conclusion. Their attempt to dismantle the distinction between highbrow and lowbrow art continues the trajectory of postmodernism, where ironic detachment is replaced with a subtler and possibly more compelling way of engaging with these ideas. Shock value and direct irony is replaced with ambiguity. Are they serious? Are they joking? PC music looks to transcend this concept of binary authenticity. It's an acknowledgement that authenticity is just another product to be bought and sold. As A.G. Cook has said in interviews, quote, authenticity is a tricky currency, end quote. Playing with these tropes looks to a subtle critique However, it almost never pushes into straight-up satire. Even vaporwave still comes from a sense of ironic detachment. It says, look how depressing and empty the virtual plaza of late capitalism is. PC music never makes a moral judgment on the superficiality and over-the-top sentimentality, which adds to the sense of ambivalence. PC music using these over-the-top tropes borrowed from the spectacle was just as much a celebration as it was a condemnation of them. Seemingly paradoxical ideas are meshed together, attraction and repulsion, irony and sincerity, optimism and pessimism, lowbrow and highbrow, naivety and knowingness, cute and creepy, in pursuit of a plurality of desperate and elusive horizons. This also speaks to Hegel's view of speculative thought. According to Hegel, it is a natural movement of thought to turn to its opposite, negation, and for the two to coexist until the opposition is resolved in negation of negation, sublation. Hegel calls on speculative thought. Two contradictory elements are held together, uplifted and sublated without completely destroying one another. Speculative thought seeks to avoid the idealism inherent in reflective thought and allows one to think in concrete terms about how things work, both in the present real world and in history." End quote. Steph Kratovitz, in her essay, You're Too Cute, Sophie, PC Music, and the Aesthetic of Excess, writes, quote, In a time of ever-expanding markets feeding on rebellion, that futility makes sense, where there's an oscillation between two seemingly opposing ideologies of capital and resistance, 
It creates a feedback loop of celebrating and rejecting a hypercapitalist aesthetic of endless consumption, until the two inevitably blur into one. In enjoying the superficial frippery at the same time as recognizing its profoundly destructive darkness, more appears to be the maximalist mantra that Chiari and Sophie share, but of what remains a mystery. That's the revealing duality of this 21st century incarnation of cute. It identifies the emptiness in excess that is as true as it is ultimately terrifying. Furthermore, PC Music's critique looks to transgressive art and music. In a world where art has lost its ability to challenge the status quo, true modern-day transgressive art is not some punk rock band or edgy performance art, but rather, it's Britney Spears. You can only listen to so many noise and experimental records before you realize only so much can be said in that context. The sounds of destruction, degradation, chaos, anarchy, etc. PC Music in particular says, look at this grotesquely shiny pop music like boy bands or Britney Spears, created in a sterile boardroom of executives, often engineered by white bourgeoisie men, for the main purpose of reaching as wide an audience as possible for profit, as opposed to any artistic merit. In a way, this is far more heinous than any Swans or Mertzbau record. Sophie, in her early career, would often use a female avatar as a DJ, and be dressed as a man in a suit, running around on stage and in the crowd. Other than a comment on her being a trans artist, it can be seen as a sort of performance art which says, quote, the female artist is just a vessel for the music industry to make money, and men are the curators running things behind the scenes." End quote. In works of postmodernism where violence, drugs, sex, and shock value are the norm, maybe the true subversion is its opposite. From this theoretical standpoint, the only thing more transgressive than Britney Spears is music for children. Cute and fun sing-alongs made for possibly the biggest audience of all, children and families. There is a reason that Pixar movies are always blockbusters. A.G. Cook and Danny L. Hall created a pseudo-label called Ducks Kids, seemingly for children, in 2012. The few songs released were fun and safe-for-work pop tunes about going to a friend's party and being yourself. It was not an attempt to return to the Puritan traditional values and beliefs about the family, wholesomeness or capitalism, but rather an attempt to point out just how pedestrian and banal attempts to subvert these ideas have become. According to author Mark Fisher, contemporary society has lost its ability to look forward. Because of the regime of neoliberal capitalism, we have given up attempting to envision or perceive what the future might look like. Capital's obsession with the short term and ability to look only as far ahead as the next fiscal quarter has given us a sort of culture blind spot in terms of our future. Culture seems doomed to recreate the past in the trans-aesthetic moment. In the past, new explorations in art and music attempted to create something new, but then we have become obsessed with retrospection. Shows like Stranger Things and music genres such as synth pop only look to recreate aesthetics of the past. In a world of increasing ecological, social, and economic concerns, we return to the past, trying to reimagine how we saw the future back then. Even contemporary futuristic media like Blade Runner 2049 or the video game Cyberpunk 2077 look only to create the future retrospectively, using cyberpunk aesthetics that are already over 30 years old. In the 80s, the concept of cyberpunk was new and radical, that looked to critique late capitalism, among other things. This has been replaced with retro-fetishism and meaningless aesthetics. Gone is the critique of late capitalism, and it is replaced with a sort of empty cyberpunk pastiche. From a sonic standpoint, PC music actually looks to create new avenues for futuristic pop music. Marshall McLuhan writes in Understanding Media, quote, the message, it seemed, was the content as people used to ask what a painting was about. Yet they never thought to ask what a melody was about, nor what a house 
or a dress was about, end quote. On the subject of art history, McLuhan interpreted Cubism as announcing clearly that the medium is the message. For him, Cubist art required, quote, instant sensory awareness of the whole, end quote, rather than perspective alone. In other words, with Cubism, one could not ask what artwork was about, content, but rather consider it in its entirety. Similarly, PC Music and Sophie looks to explore this theme of instant sensory awareness of the whole. Sophie's music doesn't ask what the music is about, but rather looks to explore sensory content as the message. Sophie uses subtractive synthesis to create her plastic and metallic sounding rhythms and melodies. Clanking metal sounds and distorted bass are a completely new direction for pop music. From a sonic standpoint, it is not so much about something, but rather is about sound itself, a vibration that propagates as a mechanical wave of pressure and displacement through a medium such as air. Few other artists are looking to the way technology can be used to create new sounding visions of the future. To those who say, I like music with a message. PC Music says, bass frequencies are the message. Unfortunately, in recent years, PC Music seems to have pushed pop music to its ultimate limit, until it eventually collapsed under the pressure. Many artists floundered as producers went on to work with bigger names. What started out as an expansive art collective dwindled down to a couple of producers occasionally pumping out tracks for big name artists. Although it is not direct satire, PC Music's somewhat satirical nature requires a clarity of purpose, lest it be mistaken for and contribute to that which it intends to criticize. And that is where the problem lies in PC Music taken out of its art collective origins. Gone is GFOTY's tongue-in-cheek ode to capital on Money on a Gold Plate, which has been replaced with an insipid Diplo-produced Madonna track, Bitch I'm Madonna, in full-on PC Music pastiche mode. What started out as an idiosyncratic critique of late capitalism, intentional or not, ended up being boiled down to aesthetics. Pop star Charlie XCX has the charisma and quirky attitude seen in PC music, but lacks any meaningful critique. Not all music needs to make a statement. Sometimes entertainment can be just plain old entertainment. However, it is ironic that producers who set out to make challenging pop music end up making formulaic and vapid pop for actual pop stars. No other movements in recent history look to these complex and compelling ideas the way in which PC music has. In a world of endless simulacrum, where art has lost its subversive force, it's necessary we come into contact with the ideologies of capital, resistance and subversion, and play with them in new and interesting ways, if we are ever to find our way in the trans-aesthetic space. <laughs>